Hello, Rune Scholar, wherever and whenever you are. I'm the Modern Aralar. I mentioned as early as episode 6 on the Anglo Saxon Futhwark that runes can appear in manuscripts in addition to being carved into more durable materials like wood or bone. Runologists call these runica manuscripta, and about 60 manuscripts containing runes survive from between the 9th century and 1550. We need to remember that manuscript runes were a step removed from carved runic writing because the runes have been written onto a page rather than carved into something more durable. This shift in medium inevitably changes their visual style in that rune scribes tended to incorporate more curved forms than did rune carvers, adding a slant from vertical or some ending flourishes, and thus distorting the visual style of the runes. The manuscripts themselves show runes in several contexts, which have been described by René Derolet, one of the first scholars in the 20th century to systematically study runes that were written instead of carved. Some manuscripts depicted futharks in the context of other obscure writing systems, either real or Im invented, for example, in the Book of Orums that I referenced in my episode on runes in Ireland, the runes that look reasonably legitimate appeared alongside the ancient Irish writing system. Or as a different example, Rabanus Morris's De Inventione Literarum, which records purportedly Marcomannic runes, consists of a fictitious mixture of the Elder Futhark and the Anglo-Saxon Futhork in a Carolingian attempt to provide the Latin alphabet with runic equivalents and impress readers with how cosmopolitan the Carolingian Empire was. Many manuscripts record a runic alphabet in which the traditional Futhark order is rearranged to correspond with the Latin alphabet. Some manuscripts are treatises on the use of runes, like the Is Runar tract that I referenced in episode 3 that described how to use the runes as encoding systems. And then there is a more miscellaneous category describing the non-alphabetic use of runes, which is the most varied group. Within this last miscellaneous group, the more recent scholar Alicia Bauer has emphasized that the various non-alphabetic runes are actually the strongest proof of runic literacy. While scribes or bookmakers could have simply matched up symbols when they used runes as reference marks within a text, or choir marks that indicate how a book should be assembled, these artisans also used runes to sign their works, sometimes in quite elaborate fashion. In quite a few Icelandic and English manuscripts, scribes used runes such as torn and wundjo to represent Germanic sounds not adequately represented by the Latin alphabet, so these scribes clearly understood what sounds those runes indicated in inscriptions prior to incorporation into manuscript texts. Runes can record notes in the margin to provide a gloss or a direct translation of a Latin text, or otherwise annotate it with explanations or quick reference notes for locating useful information. Scholars have long made notes in texts using the language with which they are most comfortable, and I've certainly done this myself. Runes were also used ideographically, standing in for their name in a vernacular text that is otherwise written in a Latin script. For example, we know from the Cotton manuscript Vitellius A15, one of the manuscripts that records the Beowulf epic, that the Ödel rune was used at least 13 times to stand for the words homeland or inheritance, both of which are reasonable meanings for the name of the rune. Rune writers, therefore, would have needed to know the names of the runes in order to make that substitution of rune 
for word. 20th century scholars, including Anders Bexted and Richard Page, felt that manuscript runes expressed an antiquarian interest in the study of runes rather than a living tradition, and that any manuscripts written in runes were necessarily transcribed from an original text in Latin letters. But us 21st century scholars, with our access to the wealth of medieval inscriptions from Bergen, and the benefit of hindsight, take a much more nuanced look at the surviving use of runes into the Middle Ages. The current consensus seems to be that some manuscripts represent a degree of living literacy, while others display varying qualities of historical scholarship. The earliest medieval texts tend to indicate a relatively close correlation between the runes that appear in manuscripts and the runes that appeared in inscriptions. For example, the Abecedarium Nordmonicum, dating from the 9th century, generally corresponds to runes written on the runestones at Jurlev and at Malt. These runes were probably an English export that traveled alongside English Christian missionaries during the 8th and 9th centuries, probably representing genuine runic knowledge. Once set down on vellum in the countries to which they traveled, and from that point copied, however, some manuscript runes began to evolve their own lineage, incorporating elements of scribal hands like serifs and flourishes, errors of transcription, and other deviations from the practice of carving runes, probably incorporated by contemporary scholars who learned about runes from colleagues who grew up with them, foreign scholars who were just as fascinated by runes as we modern rune scholars are. It's kind of like how you can study Norwegian as a foreign language, but Norwegians grew up speaking it, and the two groups learned the language differently. So what does this difference look like when we observe it? The Byland Bede manuscript shown here contains a 21-letter Latin alphabet and a corresponding set of runic graphs, then another line with a series of runes and rune-like symbols. The Byland Bede was probably composed mostly by a single scribe between 1150 and 1175 in Yorkshire. While some of these runes are what we would expect, runes for the B, F, K, and R sounds, for example, look like they should. Some runes, like N and uh, this very Anglo-Saxon-ish O, uh, have long tails or upward serifs added to them that would they would have been typical of a contemporary Cistercian book hand, but not typically found in carved runes. Some runes are much further from our expectations. Like this rune for A um, is dotted when we would definitely not expect it to be. And while it does generally represent resemble a short twig A, it is tilted to the left. The rune transliterated as C is a dotted cown that usually indicates a G rather than a C. The U rune I can only reasonably explain as the scribe misunderstanding what seems to be a short twig S alongside a long branch S and transliterated the latter as a T, and therefore moved all of the runes over by one position in the transliterated order. Scribal errors indeed. Then, three 14th century manuscripts start to diverge even more significantly from inscribed runic practice. Cambridge St. John's College E6, British Library Additional Manuscript 10374 shown here, and Oxford Bodleian Library Junius I all relate to each other in that they all transmit similarly deviant rune forms and all three add to the standard rune row a series of very similar symbols that are not found elsewhere 
in runic inscriptions, but which purport to represent at least syllables and possibly short words. We do know that runes can be ideographic or represent their name in the same way that the letter U can also represent the second person pronoun in modern English, but runes did not in inscriptions represent conjunctions. The word for and, ok, is always written out with at least a bind rune rather than a single character. We do observe use of bind runes in the Codex Runicus manuscript, and I mentioned in my last episode that bind runes were indeed a medieval runic practice. The Codex Runicus was written on vellum in a Scanian dialect of Old Danish around 1300, using a medieval variety of the younger Futhark to record a compilation of law and history texts, including a description of the border between Denmark and Sweden that contains errors and possibly deliberately so. There is only one other manuscript fragment written entirely in the same medieval runes, the Maria Klaga, SKB A120, which is a lament by the Virgin Mary after the crucifixion. The multiple scribes who compiled these texts may have chosen to use runes to give the impression that the texts were in fact older than they are, possibly to legitimize the aforementioned border error claiming that Holland and Blekinge belonged to Denmark when they did not, or give added weight to the lists of kings and queens provided in the text. 20th century scholars believed that this text in particular was transliterated from an original written in the Latin alphabet, but Zachary Baker has convincingly argued that the scribes of the Codex Runicus were not just antiquarians transliterating Latin letters into runes, but knowledgeable in runes themselves. He argues this on the basis of corrections that standardize use of various allographs of the rune for the P sound, the interchangeability of dotted fehu and ur to stand for a B, both of which are reasonable, um, use of the star rune for fricative G, especially in non-initial positions, and a liberal use of bind rune ligatures. Several of these are also features of the use of medieval runes further to the north, so this may represent a genuine runic literacy. We also know of a German manuscript from the middle of the 15th century where very legible medieval runes encode very specific words within a German vernacular translation of Macher Floridus's De Viribus Erbarum, a Latin medical text. It is currently stored at the National Library of the Czech Republic as Codex 23F129, but as far as I can tell, it has not been digitized. In an Eric cure within this text, for example, the writer uses runes when writing the names of certain ingredients, like fennel or ant eggs. Another page that gives a formula for invoking the devil records various satanic names and actions within the rite. We could interpret this as an encryption strategy to keep dangerous knowledge from falling into the wrong hands, but these would have been legible to anybody who understood runes. And if we keep in mind the medieval connection between magic and medicine, we may be looking at a work intended to capture a specific potency associated with the use of runes, in addition to the knowledge transmitted by the Latin characters. The legibility of the runes tells us that there is some kind of runic literacy extant in Europe in the 15th century, at least in very specific contexts. That is not to say that antiquarians didn't exist. Snorri Sturluson was one, and his nephew, Olaf Thor Darsen Vitaskald, was also certainly an antiquarian. Thordarsson's third grammatical treatise from about 1250 gives us a section on grammar and a section on figures of speech, 
depending heavily on a Latin model for the book, but he gives us a full passage on runes and their comparison with letters of other alphabets. Thordarsson then gives us a pangram, a sentence containing all of the letters of an alphabet, like the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. This pangram was presented both in Latin letters and as a rune row, and attributed to Valdemar II, King of Denmark. While interpretations of this sentence vary, the one that I find most compelling is Katrine Axeldotter's riddle, describing how the P rune that more closely resembles a Latin K was derived from the B rune, and in fact, this specific rune overtook Dotted Björko during the medieval period as the rune for the P sound. So while we have evidence for that historical interest by early scholars like Olaf Thordarsson, especially on the continent, there was probably also some surviving runic literacy in the Nordic countries, and the interplay between inscribed runes and runes influenced by Latin manuscripts is probably quite complex, as I've already argued. Runes were in fashion among the Danish aristocracy, including King Valdemar, in the 12th and 13th centuries. But Saxo Grammaticus tells us that this may have been a discontinuous enthusiasm and literacy. Saxo described a stone in Blekinge, now identified with a dolerite formation near Brekne Hobi, that was, what he says, checkered with strange symbols which he also describes as figures meant to be read, probably runes. Saxo then describes that the king commissioned a copy of the inscription, but that it could not be understood. This may mean that some level of runic literacy was lost in medieval Denmark. The Norwegian material, however, definitely shows evidence for continuing functional runic literacy through the 12th and 13th centuries. So let's go into more detail about Norwegian medieval usage of runes, especially from Bergen, in our next episode. Thank you for reading the runes with me, the modern Erlar.